Thanks for joining us today. We love to hear how God is using this ministry to impact your life. So share your story with us at info at fellowshipgj.com. And if God is using this ministry to impact you, we would like to encourage you to partner with us financially. You can do so online at fellowshipgj.com. Select the giving option that works best for you and help us bring the message of Christ to this community and beyond. Again, thank you for joining us and enjoy today's message. Well, guys, good morning. I know that it is November 20th, but I want you to bear with me for a moment because I want to talk to you about New Year's for just a moment. And this is why. I believe that God is speaking to us, that he wants us, the people of Fellowship Church, to do 2017 differently than we've done years in the past. And in fact, I believe that God is actually speaking into our church, that he wants to release some things into our church. He wants to release some things into your family. He wants to release some things into your personal life. And, uh, but the Bible says something about this, because this stuff that we've been hoping for, it's stuff we've been praying for, and the Bible says, Proverbs 24, 27, it says, put your outdoor work in order and get your fields ready. After that, build your house I love that the Amplified Bible says it this way. It says, put first things first. So we are going to put first things first this year. We are going to put Jesus first this year. Fellowship Church, we're going to start the year off with a revival this year. This is something that our church has never done before. I want you to hear me on this. This is something that our church has never done before. And, and you say, well, what is a revival? What, what does this mean? Well, this revival, this first revival that we're going to start the year off is a three-day commitment. It's a three-day commitment for the entire family. This is for, we're going to have full-blown children's ministry. That Your kids are welcome. Your teenagers are welcome. This is something for your entire family where we're going to start off the year with four services over three days. And, and, and i got to tell you, we're going to start off Sunday morning. And it, I don't believe that it is a, a, just a coincidence that January 1st is a Sunday morning this year. I believe God wants to do something very special, very significant in our church. And we're going to start off Sunday morning, January 1st, with the word that God uh, is impressing on us to release into our church. It begins then Sunday morning, 9 and 11. And then we are going to continue with three nights of services, 6 to 8 p.m. on Sunday night, Monday night, and Tuesday night, where we believe God just wants to release passion and hope and power back into our church, back into our lives. And, and I'm, guys, I'm excited about this. I feel, I, I feel right now like I just need the Holy Spirit to help me right now because I believe that there is something he wants to release in our church. And, and, and I, I'm concerned that, that there's people in this room right now that just like the Bible says, Anytime the seed of the word of God is released, the enemy will send birds, send demons to come and try to steal that seed away. So there are some of you in here right now that you're hearing about this event, this revival event, and you're already starting to think that's not for me. And that's the enemy coming and trying to steal something away from you. Because I believe God wants to release things in our church. He wants to do things that we've hoped for. He wants to do things that we've prayed for. I mean, we've been begging, God, would you do something? And and you say, well, why? Why would we start our year this way? Why would we start off with, with three days of services? And not just that, guys. We're going to have our, our building open all three days. So if you want to come, our worship center is going to be open with people here to pray with you. So you can come in and fast and you can come in and pray uh, over your lunch breaks. If you've got to work on Monday and Tuesday, we know that there are schedules where you might be working and then picking your kids up. So we're going to have sandwiches available here before the services start at 6 p.m. So you can get here, feed your kids, and, and then um, get them into their area where they're going 
going to be poured into, so you aren't going to have any excuses to, uh, to miss out on what God wants to do in your life here. So why do this? But why is because you've already tried it different ways. I mean, let's be honest. We, we're exactly where we are because what we've done year after year after year has gotten us where we are. And there's some of you that have been praying going, God, I need a breakthrough. I need things to change. I want, I want stuff to be different. And, 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 then, and then we do things the exact same way. And for some people, New Year's looks the same. For some, it's just a nonchalant. It's just another day. But we see that first, they're very important to God. All throughout the Bible, we see that, the, that who we put first is important, what we do first is important, what we give first is important, that it is very significant when we have a, be, a, a time to begin that we put him first. You say, but wait, I, I got other stuff going on. I mean, we've done the other things. We've, we, we've put in workout programs, and, and we, we've, we've got our sledding trips, and we've got our traditions for football, and we've got all this. I mean, I mean we've done all of this other stuff, I mean, why not? Why not for 2017 Fellowship Church? Why not let's do something different? Why not let's put ourselves in a place, position ourselves and get ourselves in a place where God can bless us? It, because he wants to bless you. Church, I hope you know this. You know, Ephesians 3.20 says, he is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or even imagine. If you stop for a moment... Thank you, Jesus. If you stop for a moment and you just start imagining, God, what if you were to do the most amazing things in my life and the, the greatest things that you could come up with, where, where your family is changed, where, where lives are healed, where your, your whole business that you work with comes to know Jesus, where, where there's overflow in our church every week, the, the best things you could imagine. God is saying, well, that's kind of a joke to me because I can do so much more than that. And I want to do so much more than that. So you say, Dan, why are we talking about January 1st here on November 20th? And that's because... There's a lot of you that right now I know you're making your holiday plans. You, you, your week's out where you've got your work schedule coming into place. And I, I'm giving you a heads up because I believe that this is something that I'm positioning for God to do something in our lives. He wants us as a church to be unified together. And I don't want you to be the one to miss out on it. I don't want you and your family to be the one that, that yeah, you did the, the same old sledding trip that you've always done, or, or, or you went to the same old parties, and you're waking up and burning off a hangover and going, man, I wish I would have done something differently this year. I wish it would have looked differently in my life this year. So I'm telling you now, because I'm telling you, you might need to, to change some plans. It, you might right now need to go, well, um, but we've always done this, and, and I'm giving you enough time because maybe you need to change some flights and fly in earlier. Maybe you need to ask someone else to fill in your shifts so you can be off because I believe, guys, I believe that God is speaking to our church that he wants to do something radical. He wants to release something into your life, but it's not gonna happen if we keep putting everything else first. It's only gonna happen when we get our priorities right and we realize that, you know what, Jesus is preeminent. He is before before all, he's above all, and he is going to be first. Mm. So, Fellowship Church, do you want to see what Jesus could do in your life this year? Then it's bigger than just a shout and a holler, it's a commitment. And I want to encourage you to leave today, sit down with your spouse, sit down with your coworkers, sit down with whoever you need to, and open up your calendar and make some changes. Make a three-day commitment to begin our year praying for God to release his power in our church in a whole new way, whole new way. Again, good morning and happy New Year's. Um, I want to help you get your heart right for what God wants to do in you with you, for you, and through you in these next three days. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the messages have been written. Um, the pastors are ready. The, the worship team has been practiced up. There's been intercessors who have been coming together and praying for you over the last several weeks. There's been people getting together and praying specifically for you for this next three days, for this revival. But let me tell you something. It's not the job of a pastor 
It's not the job of a worship team. It's not the job of intercessors to bring a breakthrough. In fact, I'm here to announce to you today that this revival is a BYOB revival. Okay? In fact, turn to the person sitting next to you and tell them, bring your own breakthrough. Bring your own breakthrough. Come on, people. I need the enthusiastic, the passionate people to speak with me today. Now turn to the other person, the one you didn't choose for whatever reason, your second choice. Turn to them and say, now bring your own breakthrough. I'm just curious I want to ask you again, I asked this at the beginning of the service, but I want to ask you again, if there's an area of your life that you need to see a breakthrough, if there's an area of your life that you need to see changed, some place where there's been pain, some place where there's been stuck, uh, you've been stuck over this last year, I want you to be honest and put your hand up. Now, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pass the microphone around and ask you what it is. You can keep this private right now, but, but put your hand up if you need a place of change i got to tell you, you are in a good place today. And I want you to join me in, in the text, in the text uh, John chapter 5 today. We're going to look at a story that's an encouragement today. And it should be an encouragement to anyone who uh, needs a breakthrough. Because we're going to take a look at a man who, he was stuck. He was in a situation where he needed a change. And for a long time, he hadn't been able to change. And unbeknownst to him, he he found himself in the right place in the right time because unbeknownst to him that day, Jesus was passing by the pool at Bethesda. And we see here, John chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, the Bible doesn't specify Which Jewish festival? There was a lot of them, but what this tells us is that Jesus had a reason to go to Jerusalem. That that he was there for the festival, but somewhere along the way, Jesus, God himself, the grace of God personified, decided to take a detour and head towards what was called the Sheep Gate. It says, now there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. So what that tells us is Jesus had a reason to be there in Jerusalem. Now, catch this now, but but we see in the text there's a meeting within the meeting that the people had a reason to gather together uh, to worship God and and to be festive and to be excited about something that, that God was doing for them. There was a meeting together, but Jesus had a meeting within the meeting. He, he had an appointment where he wanted to go meet with someone on an individual basis. He was looking for someone who was going through a difficulty. He was looking for someone who was stuck, and he went out of his way and made a detour to go find this man who was stuck, and the scripture further goes on in detail that they're at this pool called Bethesda, and it says that, that which is surrounded by five colored colonnades. And here, a great number of disabled, disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed, the gossips, the addicted, the cynical. Now, I could hit you too, right, if I kept going, but I won't. I'll just jump on to the next verse. In fact, let's, let's look at verse chapter 5. Notice here we go from verse 3 to verse 5. And we'll, we'll get into why a lot of Bibles don't show verse 4. Some of the older manuscripts don't have verse 4. But, but we'll get into that later. Right now all you need to know is verse 5 tells us, One who was there had been an invalid for 30 years. Eight years, And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, for a long time, Jesus said, no use bothering with him. He's been that way for too long. He's just going to be stuck that way, right? I mean, that's just John over there. I mean, John's always been that way. You don't know John's story. John, John's got some stuff he's been going through, and so John ain't ever going to change. So, so, so Jesus just left him alone, right? No. No, we see that Jesus walked right by all the other people, and he looked for this man who ended up being the most difficult situation at the pool. He, he went to the most difficult person there, the, one, the, the place that looked the very most hopeless. He went face to face and got with that man. 
And i got to tell you, sometimes in church, I think what we do is we think that God can only handle and only wants to work with our presentable parts. So we come to church and we put on a show and we put on a smile on our face and try to bring God our presentable parts, right? And we come into church and like, let's be honest. I mean, like we were cussing at our kids in the car on the way here, right? And then we come in and like, how you doing? Oh, I'm great. Jesus is awesome. It's good. It's a happy new year. Your, your neighbor's dogs are barking all night long. You're angry. You were frustrated. We come in and we put the smile on our face like I, I can only give Jesus my, my presentable parts, right? I can, only take, I can only take him the good side of me. But what we see here in this text is breakthrough happens when you're willing to expose expose that place that place that place that you wish wasn't there that secret place the the place you hide the that that, that dark place i got to tell you guys for the last several weeks i've been praying big time for in my life and for in our church for breakthrough when i i believe at the beginning of this i was i was praying god would you help us would you move us forward in this area and that area and and the more i began praying for breakthrough the more god began bringing me to that place that dark place on the inside and he said i want to bring you face to face with some areas where i'm not first place in your life i want to bring you face to face with some areas that that, that are the dark areas, the areas you try to cover up, the areas you try to hide. And i got to tell you today that there are some of you here that, that you have been, you've been trying to cover something up. You've been trying to put on a show and act like everything's fine. And, and it's only when we recognize that Jesus wants to deal with us, not on a superficial level, but with that place that breakthrough begins. So Jesus walks up to that man, right up to that guy, that that place that situation that difficulty and and Jesus asked him a question which on the surface level seems so obvious but but as we get into it there's there's so much to learn from this Jesus asked this man a question when he learned how long he'd been in the condition it says in verse 6 he had been in this condition for a long time and he asked him do you want to get well Do you want to get well? I want to stop right here and I want to preach from the subject today where breakthrough begins. Where breakthrough begins. We're going to start our year off as a church family talking today about where breakthrough begins. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you would get me out of the way. I believe that you have a word you want to plant into each of our hearts. And it's my hope and my prayer, God, that 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 I would stay out of the way and your word would go forth and that every one of our lives would be changed, that we would be fertile soil. The enemy would not be able to distract and take away from what you want to do in this room right now. But Holy Spirit, we ask you to work on our behalf and we ask you that as we return to you, you would show us where breakthrough begins. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Guys, this month, I'm coming up on 17 years in full-time ministry. 17 years. And, and you want to know what's weird to me? In, in 17 years of ministry, I've seen something that I never get used to. It remains weird to me. And it's, it's how frequently, how many people continually, frequently come to church with absolutely no desire and no intention to change anything about their life at all. Absolutely none. That that we could come to church because, you know, it's the thing to do. It's a Sunday morning. You're supposed to go to church, right? And we're like going through the motions with absolutely no intention of change at all. It reminds me of years ago, a long time ago. In fact, I used to be a gym rat, I loved working out. I used to be a gym rat. I know what you're thinking. You're looking at me right now going, it must have been a long time ago. Yeah, shut up. (laughs) It was a long time ago. But uh, in fact, the gym was Bulldog's Gym. Some of you know how many years ago that place closed. So like, yeah, it was a long time ago. But I remember that my friends and I, we, we would lift together. And I had a friend by the name of Press. And this dude, he was ripped. He was huge. His arms were bigger than most of our legs. He had veins sticking out all over him. Uh, he looked like he was on steroids. He was ripped, right? And I would go work out with this guy every day after school. We'd go to Bulldog, Bulldog's gym together. And we had a lot of time to work out there. So we'd work out there for hours. 
hours and then we'd leave. And there was another guy at the gym that we noticed this guy. We saw him there all the time and he could be in this room. So we're going to disguise his name for all intents and purposes. We'll call him Ronnie, okay? But Ronnie was at the gym every day when we got to the gym. And Ronnie was at the gym every day when we left the gym. He was there before us. And he was there after we left. But let me tell you something. Ronnie did not have the body indicative of someone who would be at the gym all day long working out for so many hours, spending his waking hours there. And I remember asking my friend Press, I pointed at him one day and I said, this guy's here all the time. What's up with him? He's, oh, <laughs> that's, that's Ronnie. Ronnie don't want no gains. He ain't here to work out. He ain't here to change. In fact, Ronnie's just here to try to talk to girls on the treadmill, right? Ronnie's here for the social aspect. He wants to hang out and see what girls are working out. He just wants to watch the girls work out. In fact, Ronnie was a creeper, man. <laughs> like, Ronnie wasn't there to change. Ronnie was there for any other reason but to change. It reminds me of the day I got invited to lunch by a friend of mine by the name of Dwayne, he was a trainer, a trainer in our church, in our community for a while. He, he was a physical trainer, and he began offering to me a, um, as we had this meeting. He, uh, so I'm meeting with a physical trainer, and this meeting is taking place at Chili's. Uh, it's unique, because normally when you meet with a trainer, you go to the gym, but I had to have my basket of hot wings while we were talking, so while he was eating his salad, he began to, uh, to introduce the notion that, Dan, I'd like to help you, and I'd like to train you, I'll even do it for free, I just want to help you out in this area of your life, and I'll, I'll train you for free, uh, just come on down to the gym, and I was like, man, that's a great idea, but first, before we start this, you got to know some things about you, you got to know first off, I don't, I don't do cardio. Okay, I hate the treadmill. It ain't going to happen. Don't ask me to get on the treadmill. It's not going to happen. Don't like those bikes either. They make me all sweaty. It's not going to happen. In fact, um, you should know as well, I don't do anything where my face is like down towards the ground. I don't do push-ups. I don't do sit-ups. In fact, while we're on it, I don't even like to do legs. So let's just skip leg day altogether. And I began prescribing to Dwayne what I would and what I would not do. It reminds me of a time when I went to the dentist. And this sweet little dental hygienist came out and as she began working on me, she said, Dan, I need to talk to you about something. I interrupted her. I didn't even let her finish her sentence. I said, I know you're going to tell me to floss. I know. I know this, but let me tell you, I, I, know I don't like to floss. I don't want to do it. And let me go ahead and just pause this conversation and tell you the same thing that I told every dental hygienist before you, and, and I'm going to tell you, and I'm probably going to tell people after you, I don't floss. I mean, you can come out, and you can give me the little floss dispenser with the Spider-Man face on it, and you can tell me all the stories of the, of the horror stories of people who didn't floss. You can show me a little picture of Johnny who didn't floss, and now he lost all of his teeth, and he lives underneath the bridge, and you could tell me these stories, but I do not floss. It reminds me of how some of us come into church week after week. How we can come in and come sit down and find a place in here, and I can get up on this stage, or some other pastor can get up on this stage, and we can preach our hearts out. I mean, I could scream at the top of my lungs. I can, I could. Preach until my intestines come out. And there's some of us that come in with a steely resolve that will say, I do not change. I'm not going to change. I don't want to change. That we could come in here and say, you know, this is all well and good. It's all nice, but I'm not here for change. Now, don't get me wrong. There's certain things in my life I would like to see changed. I would like to see circumstances change. I'd like to see situations change. I'd like, I'd like my marriage to change. I would like to see certain things in my life change, but I do not change. In 17 years of ministry, I've come to notice that there's a lot of us that we like the idea of God changing our circumstances a lot more than we like the idea of God changing us. So there's this pool called Bethesda. The Bible says in John 5, 3, it says, here a great number of disabled people used to lie. Let me tell you something about every person sitting on your row. 
on your right and your left, every person that you're sitting next to, they have a condition. Each of us in this room, we have a condition. And it may not be a physical condition, but we have a condition. It might be an emotional condition or a spiritual condition. And what's true about an emotional or spiritual condition is we can cover it up a lot easier. I mean, we could put a smile on our face and we could put out the facade to, to try to make everyone think we're okay. And we could be struggling with something spiritually and try to use intellectual talk and, and church talk to where everyone thinks that we're okay. And we can cover it up. And what happens when we cover it up is that we can stay that way for a really, really long time. So let me ask you a question and then I'm going get to out, get out of your way. I'm going to ask this question and... and and we're going to move on so that you can come back hungry tonight. Kind of like when my mom used to catch me um, after school, putting a hot pocket in the microwave at 4.30 in the afternoon. She'd say, Danny, don't ruin your appetite. And I want to tell you, church, I, I don't want to ruin your appetite. I want you to come back tonight hungry, hungry as we search for God, hungry as we return to the Lord, because I believe God wants to do some amazing things. But let me ask you a question again. Is there an area of your life where you need to see change? Is there an area of your life where you need to see breakthrough? Because I can tell you over the years, I've prayed with a lot of people in our church, a lot of people, and and. Without exaggeration, I believe 90, maybe 95% of the times I talk to people that, that want me to pray with them about a breakthrough, they'll say something like, I, I need a breakthrough. I need to see some change in my life. My, my relationship needs to change because my, my spouse is acting crazy. Or, uh, so God needs to fix my spouse and let's pray for my spouse right, right now. Or, or, or they'll say, you know what, um, my kids are freaking out. So would you pray with me about my kids? Or, or, or like, I hate my workplace. My job sucks. It's because my boss is horrible. And, and would you pray with me about my boss? And, and I'll tell you, I love praying with people. I believe we should bring everything before God. But what is absent in so many of these conversations when I talk with people who want prayer is, is, is they come forward and they say, okay, I want breakthrough and I'm not hearing people say so my marriage is struggling right now so 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 would you pray with me that I would change would you pray with me that I could be a better spouse or, or, or someone coming forward and I, it happens sometimes but for the most time this is absent where they say you know what my kids are freaking out would you pray with me that I could be a better father or, or my workplace is horrible. Would you pray with me that I would bring a different attitude, a different atmosphere into my workplace? It's like, like David is saying, it's like, I, I, I need to be set free from me. You know, I, I don't hear people coming forward and saying very often, like, God, would you change me? I'm selfish. I'm addicted. I've got issues. I've got secrets. I've got that dark place. God, would you change me? And David said, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit in me. It's like, God, would you look to the inside of me and change me? And Jesus walks right up to this guy who's been stuck for so long. And he asks him this question that seems so obvious. He says, do you want to get well? This question is, do you want to change? It, it's not, do you want it to change? Do you want your circumstances to change? And he's asking, do you want to change? Do you want to change? And apparently this man, not only does he have a physical disability that impairs him from being able to walk, apparently he doesn't hear very well either because Jesus asked the question, do you want to get well? And the man's answer as it comes back is not, it's not directly answering that. It's like he didn't even hear the question that Jesus asked. This reminds me of a time when I walked in when Amelie was like letting our kids have it. Like, they were in trouble, and she was letting them have it. You ever caught your spouse letting your kids have it? Let's be honest now. We're a family here. Oh, we're the only, we're the only family that ever gets on to our kids. Like, maybe we just need the breakthrough. I don't know. But have you ever found your spouse? Let me tell you something. If you're newlywed, if you're, if, here's some marriage advice. If you ever come in, your, your, your spouse is like laying in your kids, just step back and look stupid and don't say a word, all right? Stay out of it. But I came in one day and, and she was letting our kids have it and Rachel's crying and saying, well, I screamed at Kayla because of this and you don't know what she did. And Kayla's going, why? Well, I, I screamed at her because of this. And we're calling each other names. And finally I was like, stop, stop it, stop it. I didn't care.
care who started it. I don't want your story. I, I didn't care who began this. I'm about to finish it right now. That's what she said. So pray for her. <laughs> pray for her. I'm just kidding. I love you, baby. <laughs> I'm going to start this year off right. Um, woo. <laughs> I don't care who started it. I'm about to finish it right now. A good parent doesn't care who starts it. And Jesus, it's like I, I would expect him somewhere along the way as this man begins pouring out his excuses that he would say, I didn't ask any of that. I, I, I don't care about any excuses. I don't care who started this. I don't care what started the situation. I'm about to finish it right now. So Jesus asked the question, do you want to get well? Not do you want to feel better. There's a difference. You catch that? There's a difference between getting well and feeling better. This is not about comfort. Because you could go to church to feel better and never change. You can go to church to feel better and never get better. That's what the pool represents. This was a place where people hung out with other people that had the similar disabilities of themselves. They, they had the same problems other people had. So by getting around other people that had the same problems that I have, it makes me feel a lot better about my own dysfunctions. So, so you could get around a lot of people and you could feel a lot better but not really change at all. So I'm wondering, are, are we hanging out here just so we can feel better see this is one of the reasons why i look back at working on children's ministry with such fondness the years i got to work with kids i love working with kids because kids haven't learned yet right they they haven't learned the things that you and i have learned they haven't got all crusty you know they haven't got all negative and gone like a negative, hopeless look on life. I mean, they haven't learned the things like things never really change. They haven't learned the things like this is the way it's always been, so it's the way it's always going to be. And, and it's like I, I, I look forward to, to talking to people who God is beginning to open their eyes and, and show them that, yes, things still do change. And maybe you've been stuck for a while, but they still change. And this man w was feeling like things were never going to change. He was sitting there beside this pool waiting for verse 4 to happen, waiting for some sort of change. Now, remember, I told you a lot of uh, Bibles don't have verse 4. The reason why a little side Bible study topic is there are many uh, older manuscripts that do not include verse 4, but uh, along the way there was uh, additional manuscripts that were written to explain why was it that people hung out by the pool and one line is added in. Some of your Bible translations have it, some don't. If you have the NIV, it doesn't have it, but in verse 4 there's a little footnote and says look at the bottom of the page and it will read what verse 4 shows up in some manuscripts. Why is it that people would hang out beside the pool? It says this. And they waited for the moving of the waters. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down. So uh, sometimes I believe that that's what we're waiting for God to do when we pray for breakthrough, when we pray for change. God, would you come down and fix my situation? Would you come down and fix me? Would you come down and heal my marriage? Would you come down and heal my finances? Would you come and fix this? And I believe over the next three days, we can pray that way. It's right there in Scripture. We can pray, God, would you come down into my situation? And I believe we should pray that. But at the same time, we, we look on, it goes on in verse 4. It says, from time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir the waters, and the first one into the pool after each such disturbance which would be cured of whatever disease they had. See, this puts this man who's lying on the mat in a very disadvantageous situation. Because when the angel of the Lord would come down, the first one in would win. The first one into the water would, it would win. And that's what religion does. The first one in wins. The one who serves the most, the one who has the most titles, the one who looks the most churchy, they're the one that wins. That's what religion says. But all of a sudden we see grace step onto the scene. 
And Jesus comes to say something different about the situation where it's not the first one in that wins because remember, Jesus is the personification of God's grace. It, the Bible says that uh, God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So, so Jesus is walking at, as the personification of, of God's grace and he walks right onto the scene to this man who would have been very last place in line and he steps over everyone else and goes to the man who's last place in line and says, you first. You first. That's what grace does. That's what grace does where he says, I'm going to step past all of, of the, the, the rhetoric, all of the this stuff where we have to act like we got it all together. And I'm going to go to the most messed up situation in the room, and that's where I want to do my work. So I'm here to tell you today, there's some of you that feel like you're last in line. There's some of you that feel like your situation is so hopeless. And I got to tell you, God wants you here, and he has an appointment for you here today because he's telling you, you first. It doesn't matter how messed up your situation is. In fact, the more disturbing, the more messed up your situation is, the more hopeless your situation may look, that's just more opportunity for God to come and do a miracle. We see that Jesus himself, he walks into the scene and he says, you first. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come right face to face with the person who's hurting. Right face to face with the person who maybe has even given up on something. Maybe doesn't even believe that change can happen anymore. So here they are waiting for the angel to come down. God, I need you to give me your joy. God, would you come down and give me your peace? God, would you help me? And it's, it's like sitting there at the pool begging, God, would you change my situation? Fix me, heal me, help me, God. Please, begging God. It reminds me of when my daughter Kayla came to me and she was begging for candy one day as a little girl. And she just starts crying, Daddy, give me candy, Daddy, give me candy. And I'm looking at her, and my daughter, Rachel, who's two years older than her, grabs her, and she pulls her aside and says, Kayla, this is not the way to get something from Mom and Dad. I want to pull you aside today. Those of you that have been begging God for a breakthrough, You've been begging God for a miracle. I'm here to tell you, this is not the way to get something from your Heavenly Father. You don't have to beg for something that he already bought for you. You don't have to beg God for something that he sent his son Jesus to die to give you. You don't have to beg for what he's already put in your hands. And, and get this, you, you don't have to impress anyone. You don't need anyone's approval. You don't, you don't have to receive anything, any accolades from any person to receive from God. If God says he's going to do something, it's done. And God wants to do a work in your life, and he's extending it to you. He's given the grace to you. And, you know, there's a lot of us that, that still lay there reasoning with God, if this is all the reasons why I can't. And that's what the man began to do. Because Jesus said, do you want to get well? And the man had reasons why he couldn't receive. He said, well, sir, at least he was respectful. The invalid replied, I have no one who can help me into the pool. I have no one to help me. No one, no one can get me in the pool. See the, the pool there. I have no one to help me. And, and at this point in the story, I'm thinking like, at any moment, I'm expecting Jesus to step in and go, I didn't ask any of that. I don't care who started it. I'm about to finish it. Isn't it crazy how we can stand face to face with an unlimited God and stay stuck because of our explanations? Well, you just don't know my story. You just don't know what I've been through. Oh, and it, it's crazy how... Every person that needs to hear this, like we struggle with thinking, well, certainly that's for someone else. Like, because you don't really know what's going on in my situation. You really don't know. After all, I, it, I've had no one to help me. No one has gotten me in. And, and let me just hit the pause button for a moment. And if you're sitting here today and you're going, man, I wish she was here to hear this. Or I wish he was here to hear this message. Then you're missing the point. Because... God is, was not interested in changing the outside circumstances for this man. God wanted to deal with what was going on with this man. And not the reasons why he couldn't get in the pool and the reasons why other people weren't there to help him. He wanted to help this man right where he was. And see, let me be fair for a moment because this man's making his, ex his excuses. But the truth is, everything this man said was fact. 
I've been here a long time. I don't have anyone to help me into the pool. These were all facts. But what he didn't know was is that faith has the ability to override fact. That faith can overcome the things that we see around us that, 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 that seem like inevitably this is the way it's got to be. So he begins to explain to Jesus, right? This man is explaining now to Jesus how the way things work around here. That, well, since no one can help me into the water, I'm stuck here. I can't get in. Nobody helps me. Nobody loves me. Nobody gets, I mean, every time I try to get out there, someone starts blocking me. It's like, so I appreciate your, situ- your conversation, but I have no one to help me get into the pool. No one can help me get to the water. And what's funny about this, and you really got to be a Bible nerd to enjoy this, but what's funny about this, he's complaining why he can't get to the water. And and we see if we jump back one chapter to John chapter 4, Jesus is having a conversation with a Samaritan woman at the well. And and if you've heard the story before, if you read it before, you remember the woman comes to draw water and Jesus says, woman, give me a drink. I mean, it's kind of a, a weird way to start a conversation. But he's like, woman, give me a drink. And, and she's like, uh, why are you talking to me? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. That, I mean, people are going to freak out about this. And Jesus is like, stop it. I don't care what other people think. Would you get me something to drink? And she goes, you don't even have a bucket. And Jesus essentially says, not in these exact words, but he, he essentially says, you don't need a bucket when you're the well. And Jesus is telling this woman, what you don't understand is if you knew you were speaking to the well of life, the water from God, the spirit of life, you, then you would, you would be asking me for a drink because if what I have gets inside you and begins bubbling up in you, then all of a sudden there's going to be a well within you where joy is bubbling out and, and happiness is bubbling out and purpose is bubbling out and there's so much good that can come out of you so you're not going to care anymore what other people people think. You're not going to care what other people could provide for you. If you understood that I am the water that you've been thirsting for, you wouldn't need another thing in your entire life. So now in John chapter 5, the water walks up to the pool and sees the man there, and he's, this man's going, I've got all my excuses. See, I can't get to the water. And Jesus is saying, exactly. You couldn't get to the water. That's why the water came to you. Guys, you've got to understand something in this revival. That's what grace is. You couldn't get to God, so God came to you. You couldn't get unstuck, so God came to you. You, you couldn't get your marriage fixed, so God came to you. Hear me today. There are some of you today that you have felt like, I feel so far from God. I, I feel like I'm unforgiven. I feel like I'm so far from his will from my life. And you've got to understand that grace himself, Jesus Christ, is staring you face to face going, that's why I came to you. I came to you to change you in your situation. He didn't come to change our situation. He didn't come to change this man's situation. He didn't come help the man get into the water. Instead, he came to him, and while this man was waiting there, hoping that that, that somehow something was going to change in his life, Jesus walked right over every single excuse that the man had said, and he gave him a command. See, your breakthrough begins where your excuses end. Did you hear me on that? Your breakthrough begins where your excuses end. We want to hold on to our story. We want to hold on to the reasons why we can't get help. And we see that Jesus died on the cross. He made a way for you. He he decided to come and meet you face to face to, to help you right where you are, to talk to you about that dark place in your life and to bring you change, not by changing your situation, but by changing you. So watch this. Jesus gives this man a a command. Because while a lot of us are busy trying to get God to come down, God, would you come down? Would you change me? Jesus has a very different view about how you and I are to receive change in our life. Real change, deep change, lasting change. Change that not only affects us, but affects our families and, and, and our communities and moves on. Jesus, after hearing all the man's excuses and his reasons why, and he had this, this man that had this mentality that revolved around every other person. They won't help me. They're like, someone else is blocking. Like, I'm, try, I'm almost on my breakthrough, and then they block my breakthrough. Like, I, I could almost get in, and, 
and, and yet I get stopped. He has all these excuses why. And Jesus' response to the man was simple. He looks at the man and he says, get up. Two words, very simple, very powerful. And I think so many of us are stuck right where we are because we've missed what God wants to say to us. Jesus looks at this man stuck right where he is and he says, get up. And I wonder, could it be possible, I'll ask you this question and then we'll dismiss here in just a moment, but could it be that while you're waiting for God to come down and save you and rescue you, God is waiting for you to get up? Could it be that that God is waiting for you to say, okay, I'm going to put my excuses aside and and I'm going to stop giving every other reason of why I can't be fixed and I can't be changed and some circumstance needs to change and instead what I'm going to do God is I'm going to lean into you and say okay I'll get up and I'm going to start walking and it might be difficult it might be crazy it might be it might be scary but I'm going to get up and I'm going to start living my life the way he said to do it I'm going to stop waiting for my wife to act better I'm going to stop waiting for my kids to act better I'm going to stop waiting for every situation to change that I thought was my breakthrough and realize that God is my breakthrough. And I'm going to get out. So I want to ask you, there's already some of you standing. If you know today, if God is speaking to you today that you have been leaning in, hoping for a change of circumstances, but God is telling you it's time for you to stop looking for God to change your circumstances and start praying the prayer, God, would you change me? Then I want to ask you, stand to your feet, put your hands in the air, and let's ask him, God, change me. God, change me. See, that's where breakthrough begins. That's where our lives are changed. When we stop looking for everything else to change around us, we start saying, God, I need your spirit within me. I need you to renew a steadfast spirit in me. Change me. Look at my heart, God, and change me. Over these next three days, I believe that there are going to be some amazing things that happen. We're believing God that as we return to him, he's going to revive us. As we return to him, he's going to restore us. I believe that there are going to be prodigals that are far away from God who will come home. I believe that there are going to be sicknesses that are healed. I believe that God is going to do some miraculous things, but hear me on this. Hear me on this. Where does breakthrough begin? It begins with me. And I hope every one of us could say that and every one of us could understand. Breakthrough begins within me. God, change me. God, heal me. Now, our musicians are ready and our, our sermons are ready, our intercessors are ready, but, but just like I said 25 minutes ago, this is a BYOB revival. Bring your own breakthrough revival. What does that mean? It means maybe the only thing that's blocking your breakthrough from what God wants to do within you is your, your ability to believe and your willingness to believe that God is willing to change you, willing to help you. And do, let, me even, let me ask you, do you even believe that anymore? Do you believe that God wants to change you? Or, or are you okay with settling and living a life that, that, that Jesus died to take you out of? See, this man's breakthrough began when he listened to the words of God and he decided instead of praying for God to come down and change my circumstances, I'm going to listen to the voice of God where he says, get up and I'm going to do something simple. I'm going to pick up my mat and I'm going to walk. Jesus' call to us over and over and over again in Scripture is follow me. Follow me. We've been overcomplicating our lives. Looking at all the different things that if I could just do this, then I'd be fixed. If I just do this, then I'd be fixed. If I, no, no, no. Jesus says it's so simple. It's so simple. Just follow me. Obey me. Spend your life following me and pursuing Jesus. He's saying spend your life pursuing Jesus. That's where breakthrough begins. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, I pray right now.
as we get ready for what you're doing in each of our lives, some of us need to repent. Because there's some of us that right now we've been going, you know what, I have spent the last however many years of my life stuck waiting on a circumstance to change with not even knowing that all along God has just asked me to get up to follow him to walk and that God you are the breakthrough and if I hold on to you and I lean into you and I stop waiting for other people to change that is where breakthrough begins so God we pray right now that as we lean into you your grace would come and fill this room that you would grab a hold of each of us that you'd begin changing us that you begin speaking to us and that this year as we put you first God you would help us return to you help us God to get right behind you and get right in step with where you're going and it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray and everybody said amen if you believe our God is good let's give him a shout of praise today Thanks for listening to this week's message at Fellowship Church. If you have not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. The Bible says in the book of Romans, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can do that right now. I just want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe that you're Lord, that you died on the cross for my sins, and that you rose again. And God, I thank you for that. I ask you now to be my savior, to guide my life, and to give me a home forever in heaven. And God, I ask you this in your precious son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. If you just prayed this prayer for the first time, or if you need prayer, we would love to hear from you. You can contact us at 970-245-PRAY or at prayer at fellowshipgj.com. Thanks again, and we hope to see you next week.